I was only reading American writer Edgar Allan Poe again because I'd found out he'd been in foster care. I'd renounced his work years ago as too macabre for my taste. And yes, his stories are nightmarish, but in a spirit of solidarity with another former foster kid, this time I persisted. Edgar Poe was born in Boston in 1809 to actors Elizabeth and David Poe, one of three children. David abandoned the family a year later and Elizabeth died from tuberculosis a year after that. Three-year-old Edgar was fostered by John and Francis Allen of Richmond, Virginia, and they added the Allen to his name. John Allen was a successful tobacco merchant and wanted Edgar to follow in his footsteps, but Edgar had other ideas. He'd been a prolific poet from an early age and was drawn to follow the path of his hero, the British poet Lord Byron. Edgar attended the University of Virginia for one semester, but was forced to leave because his foster father didn't fund him sufficiently. Although he returned to the Allens, he wasn't there long, as clashes between him and his foster father were intense. At 18, Edgar Allan Poe published his first book, Tamerlan and Other Poems, and he did that anonymously. A rare copy of Tamerlan was sold in 2009 for a record price of over $600,000 way too late to be of any use to him. He had joined the army in an, in an attempt to support himself. Edgar was thrown out of the army after only 18 months, but was taken in by an aunt, Maria Clem, in Baltimore. While living with his aunt, Edgar began publishing short stories. He eventually became a successful editor, magazine writer, and book reviewer at the Southern Literary Messenger back in Virginia. His scathing reviews and personal attacks on the writers, not nice, helped to make the magazine popular, although it was stingy when it came to paying writers. When Poe was 27, he creepily married his 13-year-old teenage cousin, Virginia, his Aunt Maria's daughter. While I have a problem with that, according to Wikipedia, there is still a number of states in America where there is no minimum age for marriage, although many of them do require parental consent, judicial approval, or the situation of pregnancy. Virginia, uh, Virginia actually only lived for about 10 years after she married Poe, and he for only 12 years after they were married. By the time of his death in 1849, he had become a household name with the 1845 publication of The Raven. As I was ploughing my way through his short stories, some sources say Poe was the originator of both the short story form and the detective genre, Anyway, as I was going through them, one in particular grabbed my attention. The Black Cat was initially published in the United States Saturday Post on 19th of August 1843. The narrator is awaiting execution and busily justifying his murderous behaviour. He talks of having become an alcoholic, which resulted in him going from being a man who adored animals to the extent that his wife bought him, and I quote, birds, goldfish, a fine dog, rabbits, small monkey and a cat, to one who was increasingly irritated by and violent towards them and towards his wife. Pluto, an entirely black cat, was a favourite, fed and cared for by the narrator and protected from abuse from quite a while. Eventually, however, even poor old Pluto began to be badly treated. As the cat sensibly avoided its owner, the narrator became incensed and first removed an eye and later executed it. Soon after that, another black cat made its home in the narrator's poverty-stricken basement apartment. Again, the narrator went from being fond of the cat, which reminded him in size and colour of Pluto, to hating it. And the more the narrator hated the cat, the more the cat followed him around. Lifting an axe one day to kill the cat in a peak of madness, his wife intervened and he buried the axe in her brain. She fell dead upon the spot, he writes without a groan. The narrator promptly buries her in the apartment walls. When the police visit a few days later, the stupid man cannot help but brag about the well-constructed walls of his home, rapping on them with his cane. He was answered from within, and I quote, by a cry, at first muffled and broken like the sobbing of a child, and then quickly swelling into one long, loud and continuous scream utterly anomalous and inhuman, a howl, a wailing shriek, half of horror and half of triumph, such as might have arisen only out of hell, conjointly from the throats of the damned in their agony and of the demons that exult in the damnation. 
he had accidentally buried the cat in the cabin with his dead wife, and it was the cat who gave away his secret. The tale is one of classic domestic violence, of blame and lack of responsibility. The narrator blames all for his foul moods and extreme behaviour, the animals, the alcohol, but doesn't take responsibility for anything, not even for the murder of his wife. Instead, he claims to have been seduced into murder. It's possible that the source for Poe's story was a news article published by the Philadelphia Public Ledger on the 16th of July, 1842. A Mr George Stebbins, who took down a cellar wall in his house in order to enlarge it, had found the well-preserved body of a young woman who had been shot in the head. Poe was living in Philadelphia at the time and was likely a re regular reader of the publication. The story reminded me of another by a former orphanage kid, Australian Richard Zablicki. As a baby, he had been put into an orphanage and was abused there until he was returned to his parents at the age of 10. This for him was a very confusing time. He writes, I had gone from dormitories to dormitories and from children to adults. The parents were my new keepers and the tenants my new cohorts, and I had grown up with none of them. Voldick worked tradesman hours, gone at 6.30am and back at 4.30pm each weekday. Vazia did hospital hours, 12-hour night shifts from 7pm to 7am, two days on and two days off, although it was nearly always three days on and one day off because she worked regular overtime. Sleeping most of the day, she usually rose as I returned from school to let me into the house, and I waited, or I waited outside for a passing tenant. The evening meal was largely where the family came together, and that's how it was for most of my house years, except for Lily and the cat. Richard hadn't been long back in the family home when he became aware of the pecking order. He was at the bottom of the hierarchy after the cat. The boy had to attend to Chicky when it was upset, clean up after it, and he usually felt that his mother Basia looked after the cat way better than she did him. The final straw for Richard was the cold winter's afternoon when the child was instructed to go fetch food for the cat. A bitterly cold wind and driving rain kept everybody indoors, including the cat. However, Basia insisted I go to the butcher and buy topside mince or fillet if mince wasn't available. It had to be pure meat, no fat, no gristle. You must do it for Chicky. She hungry, poor thing. Basia turned to the cat and fussed. I looked outside. The rain was pelting. It was awful weather. Why? It'll live. Why do I have to go? Angry, I raced through the freezing rain, returning frigid and soaked to my skin. Basia was happy with the prime cut meat and Chicky was saved from starvation. But ultimately not saved from the, action, from the actions of a furious 10 year old boy. But about that you'll have to read for yourselves. So visit the People's Voice publishing website and you can purchase there either the hard copy or the PDF.